AP Biology, Chapter 41, Animal Nutrition, Part 3. Let's review the end of Part 2 here. Let's make sure that we understand the first step in digestion. Here we have the, um, the food watered up and chewed up, which uh, is mixed in with saliva. When it's all a chewed up mass of food mixed up with saliva, we call it a bolus of food. We're going to be tracing food from the in-hole all the way to the out-hole uh, at the end of the, the journey of the food, basically turning food into feces. The mouth is the first place where we have mechanical digestion. Remember, mechanical digestion, and you do need to know this, is physically breaking up the food into smaller pieces to increase surface area so that the enzymes can act on it more efficiently. We also have chemical digestion starting in the mouth as well, and you should know that the only chemical digestion that happens in the mouth is of starch, a carbohydrate. Remember that starch is a chain of sugars, glucose, and we can break down the starch into glucose using the enzymes in the mouth that we'll talk about in a minute. The epiglottis closes the trachea when swallowing. Here we have the epiglottis right there. And then when that bolus of food comes down, this little epiglottis closes over the top here, called the glottis, to prevent food from going down the trachea to your lungs. So here's the epiglottis up, here's the epiglottis down, and then the mass of food doesn't go down the wrong tube. It goes down the esophagus. There's two major big tubes in the neck. We have the trachea, which is your air tube, and your esophagus, which is your food tube. The common tube to both right here is called the pharynx. I remember the pharynx because the fair kind of sounds like food and air, and it's your food and air tube, the pharynx. So we have food and air coming down here, and then air goes down the trachea, and food goes down the esophagus. A couple other points I want to talk about here. Let's say you're drinking milk and someone tells you a funny joke. Have you ever had the milk come out your nose? How does that happen? Well, you're drinking the milk. Here's the milk coming down here. And then someone tells you a joke. So what happens? You start laughing. So the air comes up from the lungs, up into the trachea, comes up here. Here's your milk. And then the air just pushes it all the way up into your nose and out your nose. And that's why the milk comes out your nose when you get told a joke when you're um, drinking milk. Also, let's talk about the Heimlich maneuver really quick. Let's say your epiglottis doesn't close properly when you're eating some food and the food is going down the wrong tube. When you apply pressure to the person's, uh, beneath the person's lungs, you push on the lungs, basically, increasing positive pressure, pushing air coming out, pushing on the food, kind of like a pop gun, those little cork guns, and um, eventually the food just gets pushed out again. And that's how the Heimlich maneuver works, basically air pressure that dislodges the food. Now, once that food uh, starts coming down the esophagus, it's going to be moving down into the stomach by peristalsis, which is that rhythmic contraction of smooth muscle. Imagine like a tube of toothpaste being pushed and just kind of this rhythmic pushing of uh, food until it hits the stomach. All right, you should know what saliva consists of. Let's talk about that. Remember, this is ingestion or taking food into the mouth. We have mucin. Mucin sounds like mucus, and it's very similar. It's a slippery glycoprotein. Glyco means sugar. Protein is a protein. Protects soft lining of the mouth from abrasion, kind of like lubricates the food, make it easier to swallow. So that's mixed in the saliva, and the saliva is mixed in with the food. Helps grease the, the food a little bit so it um, goes down your throat without catching. We have some buffers in uh, saliva. These are going to neutralize acid and that prevents the tooth decay. Antibacterial agents called lysozymes, you have those in your tears too, they kill bacteria that enter the food with the mouth. They're not 100% effective but they do reduce the amount, amount of bacteria in your mouth. And the last part of uh, saliva is called amylase. Remember that every enzyme uh, well, most enzymes have an ACE ending that lets you know it's an enzyme. Amylo kind of tells you what it's going to break down or put together. In this case, it's breaking down amylose. So the enzyme that breaks down amylose, a carbohydrate, is amylase. Since this um, amylase is produced by the salivary glands, we call it salivary amylase, or produced by the salivary glands, breaks down starch into sugars, and it's an enzyme. Now, we do have another amylase called pancreatic amylase, and you can probably guess where that's produced, in the pancreas. All right, make sure you have that down. Make sure you know what each one of these does, and you should know what saliva consists of. And remember, physical and chemical digestion happens in the mouth. 
The pharynx, food air tube, is the uh, common tube for both uh, esoph uh, for air and food, and it'll eventually branch into the esophagus and trachea. Remember, the trachea is in the front. You can feel the front of your throat right now if you'd like. That's the trachea. You can kind of feel those um, cartilage rings holding open the trachea. And behind that is the esophagus. Once again, the top of the windpipe uh, is called the glottis, and it's blocked by the epiglottis to prevent food from going down the wrong pipe. You can pause at this time and review your notes and make sure you understand this information. Remember, if you have any questions, ask in class. All right. Now that bolus of food is eventually going to hit the stomach. So now the food has entered the stomach. One thing you should know is that the stomach is not the major site of digestion of food. That's a common misunderstanding. The most important place and most, um, most of the food gets digested in the small intestine, actually, not the stomach. It's more of a, a holding container. It does some digestion, but not as much as the small intestine. So let's talk about the stomach a little bit. It um, can fit about two liters worth of food and fluid. Imagine like a two liter bottle. That's about how big it can get. Uh, some champion eaters that you know are in contests and things like that will overeat to kind of stretch this out a little bit more so they can fit more food in their stomach. Gastric juice produced by the uh, stomach, and we're going to talk about some details about this in a second. Digestive fluid secreted uh, by the inner lining of the stomach wall, the epithelium there. Remember that all your organs are a combination of the four tissue types. So let's go and review those four tissue types that make up organs. Remember, cells make up tissues, tissue make, make up organs, organs make up organ systems, organ systems make up the organism, organisms make up populations, which make up communities, which make up ecosystems, which make up biomes, which make up the biosphere. Remember, those are the levels of organization. Don't confuse that with the levels of classification, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. All right, the four tissue types are nervous tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and epithelial, epithelial tissue. Those are the four tissues that make up organs, and the stomach is no exception. You have nerves that are connected to the stomach to let it know to uh, start churning the smooth muscle, and that's why your stomach growls, is the smooth muscle kind of moving around. The um, epithelium is that lining, kind of protects the uh, inner and outside of the, the stomach. And then we also have connective tissue, which is just kind of holding everything together. Now in um, the stomach, you're going to be producing hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid, or HCl, has a very low pH, pH of 2. Now it's diluted with a lot of water, but um, it's a strong acid. And there's chemical digestion with that hydrochloric acid. We're going to break down the uh, connective tissue, the matrix that binds the cells together. And we're also going to kill some bacteria in the stomach as well with the hydrochloric acid. As you can imagine, it's not 100% effective. You can still get bacteria into your intestines through the, the stomach. Pepsin is the major enzyme you have to know that act, is active in the stomach, and it doesn't have that ACE ending. This one was discovered before the naming of enzymes, so uh, we used the original name, which uh, it would be nice if it was called pepsinase, but, you know, what are you going to do? Pepsin uh, breaks down proteins, and uh, that is the only major thing that's broken down in the um, in the stomach is proteins. Now there are some other enzymes involved, but most of your digestion doesn't happen in your stomach. Again, you know, rethink that if you think that that's true. It actually happens in the small intestine. The small intestine is the major site for not only digestion, but also absorption. The last thing that's uh, produced by the inner lining of the stomach is mucus, and this protects the stomach lining. So you're always secreting mucus to prevent the um, the acid from eating away your epithelium and causing an ulcer. Now over here we have something kind of complicated. This is fairly easy, you just have to memorize this and know what it does. But over here we have an inactive enzyme. If it's an inactive, and we'll take some notes on this later for this part, uh, you should write down this other stuff here though. You should know this. Pepsin Ogen. If you see something with an ogen ending, that means it will create what comes before it. So pepsinogen will create pepsin. It's like an inactive form of that enzyme. How do you activate pepsinogen to become pepsin? The answer is hydrochloric acid. 
So you see here, we have hydrochloric acid being released by this type of cell, and we have pepsinogen released by this type of cell. Now you might be asking yourself, why don't we just release the active form of pepsin to start breaking down proteins right away? Well, the answer is that you have proteins inside your, the cells of your intestine, is, or your stomach rather, and if it was already active, it would start breaking down the cell itself. So this is a way of um, preventing self-digestion of your cells and only having it active once it's um, in the stomach acid. So how do we activate it? The answer is hydrochloric acid. It has a low pH and it will cause the pepsinogen protein to fold into its active form. Once it's uh, folded into its active form, we call it pepsin, which is the active enzyme that breaks down proteins. So once again, pepsin inactive, pepsinogen inactive, hydrochloric acid activates pepsinogen to become pepsin. Now there's one more thing you have to know. The chief cells make pepsinogen. The parietal cells of the stomach make something called hydrochloric acid. I was trying to figure out a way to remember this, and I, I couldn't figure out a good way to remember it. I always just remember chief Pepsi. Chief Pepsi. I don't know. That, if that works for you, use it. If it doesn't, use something else. That's not my best mnemonic trick. But that helps me remember chief cells make pepsinogen in the stomach. And parietal cells for hydrochloric acid, I don't know. If you have an acidic personality, you become a pariah. Parietal cells, hydrochloric acid, whatever works for you. You do need to know it. This uh, information is going to be on the um, text part in a minute. But you might want to sketch this little area out with a label of the chief and parietal cells. You probably don't want to draw all these cells. But you might want to draw this part here in your notes and then label the chief cell and the... Um, I'm sorry, chief cell here and the parietal cell here. All right, we'll just go through this really quick. This is something you don't have to write down. Still, uh, the epithelium is continually eroded, and we replace the uh, epithelium by mitosis every three days. Some ulcers um, are created, actually a lot of ulcers, are created by a bacteria that can survive that stomach acid, and that's called Heliobacter pylori. So if you have an ulcer, which is a, uh, a sore on the inside of your stomach, you might be able to treat it with antibiotics. Antibiotics will kill the bacteria. They didn't know that for many years. You know, This was discovered maybe 30, 40 years ago. But um, before that, they used to just say it was stress that caused ulcer, which is kind of um, a wrong answer in many cases. Pepsin is secreted as an inactive form called pepsinogen. And these are produced by the chief cells, chief, chief Pepsi. Parietal cells, also in the pits, secrete HCl, hydrochloric acid, which converts pepsinogen to active pepsin. This is also positive feedback. More pepsin activates more pepsinogen molecules. And again, that's kind of uh, trivia there. You don't have to know that. All right. The two sphincters, we should talk about this briefly. Um, here's the pyloric sphincter, and here's the cardiac sphincter. Now, the reason why it's called the cardiac sphincter, you're probably thinking, well, this has nothing to do with the heart. It's right over the heart, so it's in the same area of the heart, and that's why it's called the cardiac sphincter. In fact, some of you might have heartburn. What is heartburn? Let's back it up a little bit. In heartburn, what you do is, um, let's say you overproduce acid, or you're lying back after a heavy meal of eating a bunch of foods that requires uh, the release of a lot of acid from your stomach. The acid can start creeping back up, back up, back up, back up, and then go down the wrong tube, down your trachea. If it goes down the trachea, then you have that kind of burning throat uh, sensation, and uh, it doesn't feel very pleasant. Um, and, you know, it could also start to erode things like your vocal cords. And your vocal cords, once they get subjected to the acid over and over, will give your voice a kind of a raspy-sounding voice. President Clinton was uh, uh, affected by acid reflux disease, so that's why he had kind of a raspy voice. Also, just to point it out, when people throw up, like especially people that are bulimics, they'll have all that stomach acid with the enzymes and all that other stuff in there, and it comes right up, and some of it drips down into the trachea, some of it gets in the mouth, and all that stomach mass acid in the mouth over and over again, uh, for people that are bulimic and throw up all the time, it starts to eat away their teeth and starts to make their voice raspy, and it's just not a good thing for your uh, mouth and trachea in general to have that stomach acid coming up. So don't be a bulimic.
pyloric sphincter, cardiac sphincter. I'm not going to test you on the cardiac sphincter. The pyloric sphincter, if you had to memorize one of them, it would have to be the pyloric sphincter that leads from the stomach to the small intestine, but that is not going to be tested. It could be on the AP test, but only if you're looking for a 5. All right, so we got the two sphincters, the cardiac sphincter, then the stomach, then the pyloric. This one you definitely are going to need to know. Pepsinogen becomes pepsin in the presence of hydrochloric acid. pH of the stomach is 2, and gastric ulcers are... Typically, bacterial infections that could be gotten rid of with antibiotics. Now, I've already talked about this first part here. We got the digestive system lined with special cells that you know secrete mucus. That's um, that's pretty uh, easy to kind of wrap your brain around. However, zymogens that's a little more confusing. The uh, the suffix gen means to create. So zymogens are inactive enzymes that will become active in different situations. The first uh, zymogen that you need to know is pepsinogen. Pepsinogen becomes pepsin in the presence of hydrochloric acid. So inactive has the gen ending, active no gen ending. Let's go and write this down. You do need to know what a zymogen is. The other zymogen that I do want you to know is produced by the pancreas. Protein digesting uh, enzyme secreted by the pancreas converted to active forms only when they reach the small intestine. So trypsin gets released as trypsinogen, and this is going to be another enzyme that breaks down protein. Trypsinogen becomes trypsin when activated, and it's going to be activated a different way, not with acid. First of all, we're continuously replacing the epithelium of the lining every couple days. Second, we have a mucus coating that kind of protects it. And then third, we make zymogens like pepsinogen that are inactive until they reach the hydrochloric acid, and then they become active as pepsin. All right, small intestine, major organ of digestion and absorption, over six meters long. If you get a small intestine stretch it out, it would be about um, 18 feet. Three sections, we have the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, and you do need to know each one of these. Now, I came up with a mnemonic trick for this, and maybe this will help you. Duodenum, jejunum, ileum, DJ Illin. You know, that's a made-up DJ, but I was thinking DJ Illin is not chillin', and uh, that helps me remember D, duodenum, J, jejunum, and I, ileum. Now, duodenum is the first section of your small intestine right over here. And that first section is where you do most of your digestion, and you should know that as well. The jejunum is absorption of nutrients in water, and the same with the ileum, absorption of nutrients in water. So if you're asked a question where the most digestion occurs in a, a mammal, the answer would be the, the small intestine, and specifically within the small intestine, the duodenum. Now we're going to be also absorbing stuff into the lining of the intestines. The small intestine has a huge surface area that we're going to talk about later. 300 square meters, roughly the size of a tennis court worth of surface area in this small intestine. Another side note of small intestines is that um, when they're making sausages, like authentic sausage from like Germany, they actually clean out the intestines of a cow or a pig, and then they stuff meat in there, and then they tie off the sections to make the sausage links. So if you ever see those sausage links in a row, they were, if they're, you know, authentic, they came from, uh, the lining was uh, intestine. Makes you hungry, right? It is what it is. You can break it down with your enzymes, just like meat. A little uh, side trivia here, about every 20 seconds, you don't have to know this for any kind of test or anything, but just to give you a complete picture of how things work, about every 20 seconds, the stomach contacts are, are mixed by the churning action of smooth muscles. And now it's not called a bolus anymore. The food mixed in with the acid is called acid chyme. Yeah, so that's going to be like the mixture of the food with the enzymes and the acid. At the opening of the stomach to the small intestine is the pyloric sphincter. We've talked about that which helps regulate the passage of chyme into the intestines. So imagine you have a big meal, you're gonna squirt a little of that acid chyme into the small intestine, a little bit at a time, squirt, 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 until the entire stomach is um, emptied. It takes about two to six hours to get all that food from your stomach to your small intestine. Chyme.
glycopyme is a mixture of acid, enzymes, and food. This is what we call it when it reaches the stomach and then the first part of the small intestine. The push of food is called peristalsis. It's the rhythmic contraction of smooth muscles. Small intestine. Remember the mnemonic trick. That'll help you. DJ Illin, DJ, duodenum, jejunum, and then Illin for ilium. Which part does the most digestion? The duodenum. That's where you're doing the most digestion. Which two parts absorb the most nutrients? That would be the jejunum and ilium. This ends part three of your notes on chapter 41.